The fact is that it did not work, not because the willing seller principle failed us, on which the drive for expropriation without compensation is based. Land reform is a mess because of an utterly incompetent and corrupt buyer. What is the risk of expropriation without compensation to South Africa's farmers? I pose this question to Dr. Tio de Yaga of the Southern African Agri Initiative, or SAI. What follows is a short extract from our longer conversation. You can watch the full-length interview by clicking on the link in the description below. Enjoy. Let's see where, where, where this notion came from, hey, expropriation without compensation. As I said, it, it's rooted in the narrative that the land was stolen and that the there's this promise by politicians that we will take it back and give it to you. So when you pay for land and land reform, it does not give you that feeling of having taken it back to redistribute it. Now in South Africa, we have three channels of land reform, a three-tiered land reform system. And the first tier is land claims or restitution, which is governed by the Restitution Act of 1996. And this is all about those families and communities who lost land because of apartheid and who were forcefully moved from land because of political reasons. And, and they could claim this land back before the 31st of December 1998. So it's a rights driven process. But then there's also the redistribution process. It used to be called LRAT the land um, redistribution and agricultural development uh, program. Um, and then to, it, it changed to the PLUS program, the Proactive Land Acquisition Strategy. Um, this is about black families who are serious about farming and who want to enter um, into the sector. And as commercial farmers, we prefer the second tier. Because here you work with individuals who really have the ambition to become commercial farmers. In restitution, you mostly work with uh, communities. Now, I can tell you it's, it's difficult enough for a father and his son to farm together. What to say, a whole community where people do not even know each other and everyone has an expectation of kind of being part of the profit of, of, of this enterprise. The third tier is about... Um, security of tenure. And this is where somebody who lives on a farm cannot be moved from that farm. They also establish their only livelihood and very often in competition with the farmer um, himself, especially in the uh, livestock industries. You can imagine if you farm with uh, stud cattle and you pay 2 million Rand for a bull, but there's another guy's bull on the same farm um, we, 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 which is from a different breed. <laughs> and now you, can, you struggle to keep him away from your, your cows. The, the, the tension it causes on farms. Um, it was not a well thought through act and it has really uh, had devastating effects, not only on farms, but also on accommodation of farms. Many farms, just many farmers would just destroy the accommodation they have on their farms in fear of somebody moving in there and then it's hard to get rid of them. Now, these three tiers of land reform has been a disaster since 2000. The mismanagement, the corruption, the nepotism, and it's, it's not because us as commercial farmers are saying that things are not right, Anyone can just read the report of our previous president, um, Kalema Mutlante, which uh, he published in 2018 on land reform, the high level report on land reform, in which he pointed out that this whole process is a mess, similar to all the corruption which we, have, we, we saw being revealed by the Zondu Commission. Actually, David, we need a Zondu Commission on land reform and on the transfer of properties over the last 20 years. In 2016, Minister Quinty, who was then in charge of land reform, confessed that more than 90% of the 
of all the, the farms which were transferred to beneficiaries has been a failure and is no longer productive. Now, I still want to see the remaining 10%. The fact is that it did not work, not because the willing seller principle failed us on which the drive for expropriation without compensation is based. Land reform is a mess because of an utterly incompetent and corrupt buyer. And if you understand that, it is crystal clear that what we really need is a total revamp of the structures in government who should manage land reform. Now, in the same time when we started with land reform around the middle 1990s, Germany also embarked on a comprehensive land reform program, which also had a restitution um, dimension to it. Actually, they had a double restitution because first, um, Jews were expropriated by the Nazis, and then the Nazis were expropriated by the communists. And they also gave themselves 25 years to complete it, but they really did so in 25 years, very, very successfully. And one of the reasons why they were so successful is the agency driving land reform was an arm's length away from the government department. So it was not so easy to have political mingling into the land reform process. Now there are 64 countries in the world which managed a land reform program over the last 70 years. 17 of them also had a restitution program and 11 of them claimed to have been successful. If you look at those 11 countries, they had four things in common. First, they were free from corruption and nepotism. It did not play a role. Secondly, they managed the transfer of land and the development of farmers as two sides of the same coin. Thirdly, they had broad national buy-in, both from the beneficiaries and from the landowner class. Everybody agreed on what should be done and how it should be done. So there was national ownership of this process without having winners and losers. And then fourthly, and most importantly, they all had a special financing mechanism, patient sympathetic capital to bring newcomers in, in, into the industry and to help them to get on their feet. Now, so South Africa doesn't have any one of those four. So our chances right from the start of having a successful land reform program was rather slim. But then of course, we, we are not isolated, as you said. I've been representing the Zimbabwean farmers at the World Farmers Organization for the last five years, and I've been intimately involved in the land reform process in Zimbabwe since the first land grabs in 2000. I've met with Mugabe a few times, and I've been negotiating a deal with the, the current government on compensation for those farmers because I had family in Zimbabwe, they were some of the first farmers to lose all their farms to expropriation without compensation. And my cousins, who are much better farmers than me, today farm in Australia and in Zambia. And when we have a family gathering and we stand around the Bryflace fire, we always quarrel about the future of land ownership in South Africa, because they always say to me, we also thought that we would be protected by our constitution. We also thought that the world would not allow the economy of this country to go down the drain. We also, we all, also thought that agriculture is too important a part of the economy of our country to see the politicians allowing this whole industry to go through the floor. But it did not matter. The only thing that matters for politicians is to stay in power. And then I always respond to them that we are not on the same trajectory as Zimbabwe. We are not like a rat in a pipe on our way to the same outcomes because we have something you never had. And that is a neighbor right on our doorstep. We went down this route. So we, we have an example on how not to do it. And then they would reply, 
Your argument is only valid if a majority of people in your country have soft ears for the voice of reason. Now, you know, if a majority of people in our country does not have a soft ear for the voice of reason, then we never had a future in this country. And I simply refuse to accept that. Thanks for watching. Let's hand over to you, our audience. What do you think is the risk of EWC for South Africa's farmers? Leave your thoughts down in the comments section. Also, if you enjoyed this conversation, you might want to check out the full-length interview. That's linked over here. You can also explore my other channel for more long-form conversations. That's linked over here. My name is Sevara Ansara. Until next time, take care.